Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Professor Jason Schultz, as my name tag suggests. Uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, I know you probably had to rip yourself away from the Mark Zuckerberg testimony to do this. Uh, and so, but don't worry, Facebook will still be there when we're done. And uh, you can watch the hours and hours of him uh, pretending to sweat in front of the House uh, committee uh, talking about all your data. But we're going to take a brief detour from that into the world of innovation and copyright, uh, which may have some surprising connections. We'll see if we can uh, talk about some of those. Um, so feel free if you haven't gotten your lunch already or water or whatever to go ahead and grab it. Um, I really appreciate that no one sat in the front row. It always makes me nervous when people sit there. So thank you for giving me some personal space. Um, just kidding. Anyway, um, so we're going to make this pretty straightforward. I'm excited to have the three uh, panelists here to talk about copyright and innovation. We're going to hit it from a number of different angles, we'll probably talk for 45 minutes or so. Uh, and then uh, open up for questions and discussion and things. So if you have questions or ideas or things you want, just feel free to note them down. They're going to be students with microphones, so you'll have to wait for them to kind of come over and hand you the microphone. But um, I'm hoping we can have a pretty uh, interesting and dynamic discussion. Um, so with that, um, we'll do introductions. So as I said, I'm <coughs> Professor Jason Schultz. I run the Technology Law and Policy Clinic here. I'm one of the faculty co-directors of the Engelberg Center on Innovation and Law and Policy. And next to me is? Uh, I am Michael Weinberg. I am the general counsel of Shapeways, which is a 3D printing company. Uh, and I'm also on the board of the Open Source Hardware Association. I'm Samantha Hedrick. I'm a 2L here at NYU. Um, and prior to coming to law school, I actually worked at Google for six and a half years in the legal department. I'm Fred von Lohmann. Um, I, uh, until about two weeks ago, worked at Google. Um, I no longer, I'm now happily unemployed, um, but I was at Google for seven and a half years, and before that I was at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a uh, nonprofit in California that uh, fights for civil liberties online uh, for nine years. And at Google, you had a title, right? I did have a title, <laughs> it's true. I've, I'm, I'm forget it all slips away so quickly. Um, I was legal director for copyright, which meant I headed copyright globally for Google. All right, so any of you who know me know that I always uh, try to get at the sort of story of how people got to where they are. I think the career building kind of aspects and the mentoring kind of aspects of like, what are the kind of ways in which we get to be people who talk about this kind of stuff is important. So the first question I have is, is a little bit of a brief history of kind of like, how did you get here? Like, how did you get to the point where you have these jobs or these issues are interesting to you or whatever? Um, maybe only one or two minutes, but I, I feel like it's a, it kind of like the story, the personal story kind of helps inform the commentary. So um, yeah, again, why don't we start with you, Michael? How did you end up here doing this kind of work with 3D printing? I got an email from you. Yeah, um, so I went to law school basically because I was seeing a bunch of neat things happening in technology and seeing like engineers figured it out and then there were legal reasons why it couldn't happen and that was frustrating and I am an exceedingly bad engineer so I thought maybe I can try and help on the legal side. Uh, I thought that I was going to go to law school, go to a big law firm and then try and get a job at one of the advocacy organizations I cared a lot about. And so I ended up working, I went to law school in Washington DC and I ended up working uh, during the during my term there at an organization called Public Knowledge, which also does a lot of public interest advocacy around technology policy. And um, I, I did the whole, this is actually only relevant to a law school crowd, I did the whole like 2L summer thing. Uh, I was graduating in 2009, and so that was the year that people did 2L summers, and then over the course of the 3L year had offers sort of delayed or revoked. And so when I got that phone call, I called up Gigi Sohn, who was running Public Knowledge at the time, and I said, I've got, an, I've got a year that I, I don't know what to do. Can I come back to PK? And she said, sure. Uh, and so that was sort of like a terrifying eight hours, and <laughs> everything was fine. And um, a couple months later, I got a call from a law firm saying, we want to have you back. And I said, I kind of have parlayed this into the job I was hoping to get after doing law firm stuff. So I, I ended up at Public Knowledge basically all the way through law school, and then for about seven years afterwards, while I was there, I was doing a lot of a uh, whole range of things. We, did, we started to do 3D printing work. And so by the time that um, I was sort of looking to see what other worlds I could be playing with, I knew some people in the 3D printing space. And so since Shapeways didn't have a lawyer, they didn't know the questions to ask me to evaluate me as a lawyer. And so <laughs> I, uh, I talked my way into the job that I have now. 
And what about the open hardware stuff? Oh yeah, sorry, the open hardware stuff. Yeah, and so also at public knowledge, um, public knowledge just got to do a lot of fun things. And so for at public knowledge, uh, in addition to 3D printing things, we did a lot of work around open source hardware because a lot of the the desktop 3D printers that started coming out a couple years ago were also open source. Uh, and so I started doing work with the Open Source Hardware Association, and sort of it's a fascinating group of people, but it's a super fascinating legal space because. There are all these people who are inspired by open source software, who are engineers, not lawyers, and don't quite understand, because it's super complicated, that copyright doesn't attach to hardware the same way it attaches to software. And so a lot of what I do with the Open Source Hardware Association is help figure out what open source means in the hardware context. Uh, and, and Jason and his clinic has done an amazing job uh, helping navigate that. And so a lot of that work is just saying, okay, like we understand what you want with open source. We understand the legacy of open source software. What parts of that translate to hardware and what parts of that don't translate to hardware and what does that mean? And how do we explain that to a non-legal audience? Cool. So. Uh, so my career path has sort of flipped the traditional one on its head. Um, I started with my dream job and then decided to come back and get the degree. So um, after I graduated from college, I actually ended up running a nonprofit for three years. Um, and one of the things that I absolutely loved doing as a sole employee was working with our attorneys on contracts. And that's kind of a weird thing to say. So I thought right then and there I was going to go to law school and become a nonprofit contracts attorney. Um, and I sort of stumbled on this job at Google. And I had basically no legal experience, basically no technological experience. Um, but it was exciting. And I did it anyway. And I thought I'd be there for a year and kind of figure out if that's really what I wanted to do before going to law school. Um, and as it turns out, I loved every second of it. Um, and it was kind of the ideal job for me. It was work that got me excited to get out of bed in the morning with people that I really respected um, and a company that I was proud to work for. So I thought I'd be there for a very short time. I ended up staying for six and a half years <laughs> um, and then eventually realized that you know, to keep uh, getting more complex projects, to get more of a say on the, the types of things I worked, worked on, um, it was kind of time to move out in order to keep moving up. So. Um, I came to law school with very much an eye towards technology law, copyright, um, and kind of hitting the 2L year when you get to choose all of your classes and it was really exciting for me and I've completely immersed myself in these sorts of classes and it's really fun to get to kind of you know, experience it in the context of real business and real life issues, but then kind of come back and you know, delve into the academic side and really pick apart what I've been doing for a long time. So Fred, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about how you ended up at EFF or any of the other kind of pathway points. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I was in law school in the early 90s uh, where I fell completely and utterly in love with the internet. Um, at the time, the internet was still kind of a new uh, thing. I remember vividly the first time I ever saw a web browser, uh, where I was, what I was doing, the whole, it was like the the way people in the priesthood talk about being called. Um, I had that kind of a moment uh, with the internet. And this was 1994, probably. Um, and, uh, you know, and I was in law school, and I increasingly felt like uh, this was something I wanted to do. Um, I thought the internet had enormous transformative potential, um, and that seemed an incredibly exciting place to get to work as a lawyer. Uh, I also increasingly thought at the time and have come to, you know, I have not changed my mind about this, uh, that copyright is really in many ways one of the great fulcrums, legal fulcrums, defining the internet as we know it today. Uh, we can talk more about that uh, as part of the panel. Um, so uh, the trouble was I was a little early. Uh, there was everyone knew the internet was kind of cool and maybe going to be a big deal, but there weren't a lot of companies paying fancy law firm rates to lawyers to do stuff on the internet. There was not really an internet practice back in 96 when I graduated. Uh, so I did a couple of clerkships to hide from the real world uh, until this whole internet thing actually became real. 
Uh, then did a couple of years at uh, a law firm in San Francisco uh, doing transactional IP work uh, predominantly, which uh, I enjoyed. Uh, and then I actually was going to be a, a legal academic. Um, I was going to go and be a professor, a copyright professor, and uh, took a year, was a, t a fellow at Berkeley to put together a paper, and several things happened that year. Uh, first, Napster happened that year, 1999, and second, EFF had a job opening that year. Uh, and I loved, I mean, EFF was always my dream job, uh, and so when the opportunity arose, I took it, and uh, the academic path seemed less interesting, uh, and as a result, I was at EFF for nine years, worked on uh, cases like MGM versus Grokster, which was the uh, case in 2005 that took file sharing to the Supreme Court, um, a number of other cases involving uh, cop sort of the nexus of copyright and free speech, copyright and innovation, uh, copyright and civil liberties generally. Uh, and it was great, it was wonderful work. Um, I left in 2010, uh, went to Google, and have, was at Google until a couple weeks ago. Uh, and frankly, I think the, a lot of the work was the same work. Uh, how do you protect the open internet from what could be uh, unwise uh, expansions of copyright law? That's been more or less what I've been doing since 2000. Thanks. <clears throat> so one of the reasons I do this is I hope you realize none of this was planned. Well, some of it, I guess there were dreams and planning and involved, but like that there, there certainly are unexpected and unsurprising turns in legal careers. So keep that in mind that you don't always have to have it all mapped out. Yeah, I, I should point out, <coughs> I also thought I might want to be a tax lawyer in law school. <laughs> I did a summer at the IRS, believe it or not. Uh, and I also thought about doing gender uh, rights work and did a summer at the National Women's Law Center. So I, I wasn't, yes, I was in love with the internet, but that wasn't my only uh, interest in law school, so yes. It could have turned out any of those other ways would have been okay. I don't know about the tax lawyer part. That might have been unwise, but the others would have turned out just okay. fine. So uh, I want to turn to the topic uh, uh, that is on the schedule and, and talk about copyright and innovation. And one of the things that I think is important for a lot of people when they think about this is, the copyright law, you know, at least initially, uh, in historic terms, was mostly focused on the kind of classic writing and arts sort of style works, you know, about books and about, you know, paintings and then eventually photographs and film, et cetera. Um, and now it seems to dominate this question, as you said, as a fulcrum of technology and that it really technology and copyright are intertwined in many, many ways. And I'm just wondering, how did that happen or what, what were some of the kind of key, what are some of the kind of key reasons why copyright has so much to say about technology and innovation right now in particular. And maybe kind of to go in a sort of reverse order, Michael, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit, like what does that have to do with this question of 3D printing and open hardware and why is it even a question in that space? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the kind of core reason is because because when there's uncertainty, you, you reach for something that will work and so if you think about this sort of these formative years of the internet especially, you had a bunch of weird things happening that people didn't fully understand. But, and, and so people were going to lawyers and saying, I have, a, I have what I feel like is a problem and I need a fix for it. And lawyers didn't necessarily know the best solution or the optimal solution, but they could say to themselves, okay, well, these computers make copies and the thing they copy are generally protected by copyright and so like, that's a tool we have. We can pull that out and we can use it and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but it at least is something in, in, a, in a panic <laughs> um, to be able to use. And so that's, you kind of end up in this space where it's there because it doesn't clearly not work <laughs> to, to respond to something that you feel like is, is changing or disruptive. For 3D printing and, and open source hardware, both of those technologies are really coming in the second, third, you know, fourth, not the first wave of, okay, mass access to creativity and creation. There's new stuff, there's old stuff, there's clashing. And so at that point, at this point, the playbook is, is drawn up in the sense that people now go to copyright because everyone's gone to copyright in the past and look for ways to, and they kind of assume 
copyright is a relevant part of the discussion because they've seen copyright be a relevant part of the discussion when Napster happens, when online video happens, when all these things happen. And so they've kind of been conditioned, especially as non-lawyers, to say, okay, well, copyright is the law that we use to deal with these things. Um, the, the twist in both open source hardware and 3D printing is for, uh, for people in business, for members of the public, for policymakers, for everyone who's been conditioned on this sort of technology thing, copyright, technology thing, copyright, where it basically worked is in both 3D printing and with open source hardware, copyright doesn't map as cleanly to the things that are happening um, as it does to music or movies or photography online. And so, whereas everyone is playing with this playbook that's been built up over the last 20-ish years, um, there's a, a kind of foundational weakness in the playbook because the legal structures aren't quite right. But almost no one on either side has sort of fully recognized that. And so they keep operating as if it makes sense. And so part of the challenges in both the 3D printing space and the open source hardware space is to try and take the kind of reasonable, rational things that have come up with the clashes around technology and copyright and see how we can move them in a space where they are, they are both sort of sensical and have a real connection to the underlying law. And, and the reason that that is important is because for 99% of cases, everything is just happening at an informal level. But that 1% of cases that actually go to trial, actually go to court, it can be a real rude awakening when you have come in with one understanding of how things work and it is kind of revealed to you and by extension the rest of the community that all of those assumptions are wrong. And so trying to find ways to avoid or, or at least reduce that shock is a lot of what's happening in the space right now. Yeah. Sam, I don't know if you want to weigh in um, and also yeah. maybe talk about the work you did in the clinic too if that helps. Uh, sure. So before I turn to the clinic, um, you know, I think one of the reasons why copyright, you know, sort of came to the internet or vice versa, um, is just the very fact of the openness of the internet. Um, you know, and in a lot of ways, the the reaction to that is going to be a sort of you know grab back. So when the internet started, it was all about sharing and this excitement about sharing. But you know, after a while, of course, people were going to say, "Wait, that's mine," um, and you know, you need something to give rules as to how to govern that. Um, and I think you know, the internet is all about expression, and so is copyright. So it, it was sort of a natural fit, I think, at the beginning, when you're focusing on the, you know, the content of the internet, that copyright would be the natural fit for it. But I think what we're seeing now is that these laws that you know, are 20, 40 more years old um, are being applied to things that are really pushing the boundaries of what you know, Congress and, and everybody else was thinking about at the time. So you've got, um, you know, you've got things like Aereo and ReDigi that are really you know, pushing what these statutory definitions mean. Do you want to say a little bit about what sure. was at issue? In, no, just so people know the <laughs> sure, technology sure. that, um, yeah. So ReDigi, which <coughs> Jason is far more qualified than I am to talk about, um, is a case, uh, you know, essentially looking at um, can you sell a file of a song on the internet? Um, and the, 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 you know, real issue there is, is it the same copy um, or are you creating a copy? So are you infringing? the reproduction right by making a copy in order to give it to somebody, even if at the end of this sale of a song, only one person ends up with it and it's not the original owner. So, you know, that's a company that, you know, really did everything they possibly could, took every step in, you know, setting up this technology to work within these statutory constraints. And, you know, there's the case is ongoing, but you know, it, there's really like this this tension of you know, when it doesn't quite work for what you want to do in a digital world, because the rules were created for selling CDs and records, it's an uncomfortable fit. Um, Aereo is another one where, um, you know, Aereo was essentially retransmitting TV, um, and there had been a previous case in the Second Circuit that um, set up precedent that said that it, um, the issue was whether it was a public performance, and the issue was really how many people were viewing the, the transmission. So there was precedent that said that as long as only you know, one person or a very small number of people were receiving that transmission, it wasn't a public performance and it was okay. So Aereo is a product that uh, created teeny tiny antenna that <laughs> were assigned to a particular user. So every user of the service had their own little antenna um, and 
the user would direct the company to, you know, I want to watch this show at this time, um, and it would be transmitted to that user. So they, you know, followed this precedent very closely, and it, you know, this is sort of relying on that dangerous precedent. Um, and then the Supreme Court said, nope, it's still a public performance. So you know, there's these rules that, that have come up and companies that are really trying to make the digital world work within those constraints, but it's getting harder and harder and we're seeing more and more of those sort of fringe cases that are really trying to move these old laws towards the way that the digital world works. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of those things about innovation <clears throat> in general, right? Like if you're a new startup or a new, you, know, you want to, uh, you know, kind of make your move, you have to go beyond the precedents, right? If everyone's just copying like the precedent that we know, then you're all basic, you're, I mean, you can still make a business of it, but you're fighting for consumer market share. You're not actually trying to do something no one else has done before. Maybe you, you know, innovate on the edges. But to take a leap forward, it opens up the gap, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, Fred, I don't know if you want to weigh in at this point about, like, what, what you know, and, and let's maybe move to some specifics, right? So, obviously, content hosting is like an area that kind of fundamentally challenged copyright. So, there was file sharing, right, which was about kind of, the movement of files, but then there is the content hosting questions, right? Why was that such a focal point? Like, why was that? Why and continues to be right this kind of area, um, and we'll, you know, and, and especially globally now. I mean, in Europe and everything else, there's like this real battle over hosting and like what and, and search and kind of combining the two. Like, why is that such a pivot point? Well, <clears throat> I'm gonna answer that question by trying to make all of you fall in love with copyright law the way I did. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, the fights around things like YouTube, the fights around uh, uh, all of the digital services that we take for granted today are to a significant, significant extent mediated through copyright. Now, it is true on day two of Zuckerberg's testimony, uh, I should also give credit to privacy law, I should give credit to other areas of law that intersect as well, but that's not to uh, minimize the role that copyright plays. Um, and so there's two things, I think, that come together to reach the, the issues that uh, Professor Schultz has mentioned. Um, one is copyright's general goal uh, is to regulate expression that is fixed in a tangible medium. That's basically everything you write, everything you film, every photograph, every piece of music, and since software is made of words, uh, it too falls within the ambit of copyright. So it would be sort of amazing if copyright didn't control and shape all of the technologies you use every day. Why, is you, why does YouTube look so different from television? Um, let's set aside for a moment the fact that parts of YouTube are actually looking more and more like television. Um, but you and I both know those aren't the parts you care about. Um, and uh, so why is that? Why is television so radically different uh, from YouTube, from Facebook, from all of the sort of media uh, hosting platforms that have succeeded in the last 10 years? Uh, 15 years, 20 years, uh, and a big part of that reason is copyright law. Uh, copyright law, I would say, constitutes well over 80% of the reason that those two media look so different. Because traditionally in copyright law, and this is a great example of the point Michael was making as well, um, and Sam as well, copyright is old law. Uh, and it was the last major copyright act that was passed in the United States was passed in 1976. The foundational copyright law we use today dates from 1976. It was designed for a media environment. And just to be clear, it took 20 years for Congress to enact that uh, law. So fundamentally, they were the, the copyright law that we live with today was designed for the late 1950s media environment. Um, much has changed. And so you have a situation where, under traditional copyright law, if you broadcast something uh, and you do not have permission from all the rights holders, every songwriter, every scriptwriter, every uh, jingle composer, if you don't have all those rights squared away, you as the broadcaster are liable under copyright law. Strict liability, doesn't matter whether you knew or not, doesn't matter whether you took precautions, you're automatically liable. Same is true for every bookstore. Same is true for every movie theater. 
Um, that, ha that was the foundation. So in that world, the only, number one, nobody's willing to take any risks because you don't want to take a lot of chances on something where you're just the broadcaster, you're just the you know, theater owner. You don't want to be the one on the hook because some filmmaker or some TV show producer did something stupid. Uh, and number two, the only people who get to play are people who have lawyers and insurance policies. Uh, because as the broadcaster, as the bookstore, as the theater owner, the way you handle that risk is you make sure everyone whose stuff you put on the air, whose films you show in the theater, whose books you sell in your store, those people have to sign something saying, if there's some copyright problem in their stuff, they're going to be on the hook for it, not you. And what that means is you're only going to do those deals with companies who are, can stand behind those promises. So big distributors, big movie studios, big uh, television production companies. That's why television looks the way television looks. It is a highly risk averse medium where the only people who get to play are people who have lawyers and insurance uh, to back up what they do. Uh, plus, of course, they have to be amenable to what advertisers like, as you all know. Content hosting on the internet is totally different, and it's totally different because of a law that was enacted in 1998 called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And the way I describe it, it's the difference between a bouncer and the velvet rope, right? Traditional television is the velvet rope. Nobody gets in unless you've got lawyers and insurance and you're vetted before you ever get in the door, right? That's traditional copyright in the media world. Still true for everybody I just mentioned, movie theaters, broadcasters, uh, bookstores, you name it. The internet, thanks to the DMCA, is the bouncer. Everybody gets in the door. But if you misbehave, you get thrown out. Um, and many of you have probably seen on YouTube and other hosted platforms, there's so-called notice and takedown where a copyright owner can complain that, hey, you don't have permission to use my song. And once that complaint arrives at YouTube or Vimeo or wherever your hosting platform, Facebook might be, then your content comes down. That difference, that single legally mediated difference accounts, I would say, for almost all of the difference in expression between YouTube, Facebook, other hosted content platforms, and the media that I grew up with, um, which television, you know, still to this day, the traditional media outlets. Um, and so why are, is uh, content hosting so controversial today? Well, you can immediately understand through that lens why. Um, it's a very different set of rules that has allowed a very different kind of expression to thrive. A much edgier, much uh, uh, less uh, least common denominator kind of expression that takes, that treats all of culture as something to be remixed. Uh, which fundamentally I think we all do in our day-to-day -day lives. We talk about the films we care about, we talk about the music we care about. What hosted content platforms allow you to do is take that and turn it into something you can post online for other people to see. Um, it's huge. I think it's net-net uh, been fantastically good for diversity of expression. Uh, but you can understand why copyright owners have some resistance to that approach. And most of the battles in copyright for the last 15 years that have gotten the biggest press attention and the most legal fees spent uh, have basically been around that tangle. Um, so that's, uh, uh, it's been an interesting set of uh, years to be a copyright lawyer in large part because of that. Now, <clears throat> Sam, I just want to turn to you for a sec. So, you know, Google pays uh, good money. Hopefully some of you will be on the receiving end of that if you uh, go for, work for law firms or other types of companies in terms of doing this kind of copyright work. One of the things we did in the clinic, though, is we, um, we do work for uh, institutions like the New York Public Library and other kinds of small organizations, the Open Source uh, Hardware Association, things like that. In, in, in the work for NYPL, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I was excited is that you got to think about some of these issues from the perspective of a nonprofit um, that maybe doesn't quite have the same situation as a Google, but has some of the similar issues. I don't know if you want to talk about that difference because that's also, I think, a growing area for copyright lawyers is thinking about the entire ecosystem. I mean, the, the big hosts are important, but you know, there's a lot of players in, in what we do to get access to content. Absolutely. Um, so you know, one of the issues to think about is what the DMCA really allows you to do, which is to scale operations. So if you take something like a library, um, library has its own collection. Library has a set of eBooks that it wants to put on the internet. 
Um, but there's lots of libraries that, that do that. Um, so the New York Public Library has a program called Simply E, um, which is a platform that allows other libraries to put their eBooks online as well as NYPL's own content. So um, you know, one of the things to think about is when you build a platform like that um, and you allow somebody else to put their content on your platform, now suddenly you're on the hook for whatever they did. Um, so you know, if you're, especially if you're a nonprofit, you really need to think about what those risks are. So when it's your own content, you can vet everything, you can you know, kind of control what that system looks like, but once you start allowing other people to bring in their own content, you need to be very thoughtful about how that's done. Um, especially with nonprofits as well, one of the, the big issues that you're going to run into is resource constraints. Um, so, you know, Google has all these fancy lawyers and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, has the ability to scale. So if you're thinking about something like the takedown requests for the DMCA, Google can afford to, ho you know, to hire enough people to be able to address those takedown requests. For something like a nonprofit, that's going to be a lot more difficult. Um, so some of the things that we were looking at is when you're bringing these other libraries on board, how might the DMCA help with that process? Um, and the DMCA, you know, part of the beauty of it is its simplicity. There's a set of rules, and it's, it's actually not that long the way the statutes go. So you have a, you know, list of rules. And it's not the tax apply, code, right? <laughs> they're, they're all in one place. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, all in one place. Um, so if you follow this, you know, this list of rules, um, then you benefit from these DMCA safe harbors, um, which are going to mean that you're not on the hook for other people's content. Um, so you know, the types of things you then need to think about is what does the notice and takedown process look like? And when you're a nonprofit, what does that look like and how is that different from a company like Google that can just say, you know, okay, this is what we need to do, let's just do it. You might not have that ability. Um, so you know, we sort of looked at what that process might look like. Um, another issue is, you know, the, the repeat infringer policy is a, a major piece of the DMCA. Um, so, you know, looking at something like that, you know, that's a real, it's, a, it's an interesting issue to look at because there's not a whole lot of case law around it. So if you're trying to figure out, you know, well, what does my repeat infringer policy have to look like, there's not a lot of answers. And if you're a company like Google, you can afford to take some risks. But if you're a nonprofit, you need to be a lot more thoughtful about you know, what types of risks you're willing to take, you know, what types of risks are important to you to take, um, and sort of where you are on the spectrum between the tensions that come in, you know, to, to everything in copyright really these days, which, you know, can involve First Amendment rights and privacy and all sorts of things that, you know, you, you kind of need to figure out where on that policy spectrum you want to be as well. Yeah, and I think that's also been interesting. I mean, so in the conversation about Facebook and <coughs> the hearings and everything, I mean, it's, you can sort of tell that in the questions and some of the thing commentary, like, you know, th there is a sense that whatever we decide is the right answer, Facebook can afford to do it, right? There's sort of this sense that, that it's not a matter of money problem for them, but often with tech policy, you have to think about, well, what about the kind of next wave? And so, um, turning to Michael, I want to I wanna kind of kick off another set of questions around what's the next wave of innovation to think about when it comes to copyright, right? So, a lot of people now are talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, you know, Internet of Things. Um, you know, virtual reality. <clears throat> so just, what are some of the areas of technology that you think um, are either already getting hit with copyright questions where we don't quite know the answers or are going to get hit with those copyright questions? And, you know, and, and are there any kind of, like, things to watch in these spaces um, uh, to pay that, in, from the copyright lawyering point of view or policy? Yeah, I mean, I think when you get to the AI stuff, there are all these interesting, like, fun copyright lawyer parlor games about what happens, who, who, does, do copyrights exist when like robots start making things and designing things and what does it mean? And you know, you can get into all sorts of bar fights about, about that kind of thing. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's, it's legitimately interesting and it goes to, and actually when you watch people discuss it, you can see people who are coming at it from a, from a kind of sense that copyright is supposed to be everywhere and it's sort of a default state and you can see people who are coming at it from a copyright has a really specific policy purpose and we're gonna evaluate the, the question against that purpose. Um, and it's, it's you just, it, that really drives how you see that answer. Um, I think for me, like I spent a lot of time in this space where there are people who are creating and distributing things on the internet increasingly that are not just copyrighty things. And so understanding that there are frontiers of copyright protection um, and how they apply in different spaces is, is an interesting legal question and also I think is a, an interesting public education and public policy question. 
Um, it, I, 25 years ago, if you were telling people that everything is protected by copyright, I suspect it's 25, 30, 50 years ago, they would have said, like, I don't know what copyright is. I don't, I, I don't know what you're saying. Um, Today, if you tell people that everything is protected by copyright, they've been conditioned to say, yeah, that's sort of my understanding. There's always copyright. Um, and if your message now is, well, actually, you're wrong. There are, there are copyright is attached to many things, uh, many things you see on your screen. But the world is full of things that are not protected by copyright. People have problems processing that concept, even though if you're spending a lot of time studying it, it's like, of course, there's copyright things, there's not copyright things, that's totally natural. And so, especially when you move from the, the, the sort of velvet rope world to the bouncer world, where you have people who are creating, who aren't backed up by giant legal departments doing their legal thinking for them, what their understanding of the rights universe looks like becomes super important. And understanding how to talk to those communities and set norms in those communities when copyright isn't, isn't an available tool in a consistent way is for me just like a really interesting space, both again on the kind of formal legal side, right? There are interesting legal cases about when copyright can attach to functional objects and things like that. Um, but they're also really interesting just kind of community organizing and education questions on how do you communicate it really matters, depending on what you're making, how copyright works. Like that's not a satisfying answer to people who are just trying to make things, right? Like, it's, that's a great question is not the response that you want from a lawyer when you're trying to do something. You want, oh, this is the answer, and I can move on with the list. And so understanding the responsible way to communicate, oh, well, I can give you the long answer, but here's the sort of, here are a couple categories of short answers that maybe work for you is something, I and mean, this is the project that the clinic worked on last semester and that we're working with the Open Source Hardware Association um, on a lot, is how do you give that responsible advice knowing there's gonna be that moment that I referenced earlier where that advice is wrong because it's an edge case that sort of facially fit into one category but it turns out it doesn't work and make sure that there's not this sort of ripple effect where the community just loses faith in all of these structures that you set up that in fact will work most of the time, but not all the time. So for me, like that's, that's a really interesting space because it combines the deep legal thinking, uh, or at least the moderately deep legal thinking that I'm capable of, and the, the kind of community organizing part of it and thinking about what it means to build communities that are creators first, but have a responsible connection to that legal foundation. Sam, for anything, any particular technologies or interesting kind of cutting edge things people should be watching? And then we'll turn into Q&A. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, <coughs> one of the, so we have to write a paper before we graduate here, and I'm writing it on artificial intelligence. Hopefully so more been, than one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but this has been very much on my mind, um, and I think there's two issues within, you know, that artificial intelligence brings up um, that we should be giving a lot of thought to, and I think, you know, in part because copyright kind of has become more mainstream now. Um, you know, people are more willing to question those really tough issues that you used to kind of be able to say, oh, we'll deal with that later. Um, there's more important things. You're really, you need to tackle the, the deep stuff now. So, um, you know, two of the things that I've seen, one is the accountability issue um, around algorithms. So algorithms are increasingly making decisions about, you know, incredibly important things in our lives. You know, where your children go to school, um, you know, whether you get benefits, all sorts of things. So, you know, when you look at where these algorithms are being used, sentencing, bail, I mean, everything, um, you know, people are increasingly saying, I want to know why this decision is being made, what factors are going into it, you know, this is affecting my life and I, I want to understand it. Um, and right now, um, you know, there's, there are some ways to reach accountability and sort of, you know, basic predictive algorithms, but the more advanced the technology gets, that piece of it is going to need to keep pace. Um, and I think accountability in deep learning algorithms is going to be a, a really interesting topic coming up. Um, and then the other piece of AI <coughs> is that um, the effectiveness of AI, the accuracy of an algorithm, depends a lot less on the quality of the algorithm itself and a lot more on the data set that you have. So the more data you have, the better the algorithm is. Um, so you know, when that's the case, you do have you know, a, a handful of companies that have tremendous amounts of data, um, 
and you know, I'm going to be going to a firm this summer that works a lot with startups. So I've been thinking a lot about you know, that sort of differential and how we might be able to bridge that gap um, and just make more data available to people so that they can innovate on their own you know, in new spaces and with new algorithms that you know, maybe the, the people who have the data aren't thinking of and aren't paying attention to. So I think that's going to be a real big issue coming up. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you guys are lucky to have uh, Professor Amanda Lewandowski, who works at the clinic with, with Professor Schultz, who's written, I think, one of the most interesting copyright papers that I've seen in years that delves exactly into what Sam was just talking about, which is how copyright constrains the data sets that can be used to train machine learning systems. So you have a situation, for example, where because of copyright, there may be very few bodies of data that you can use to train uh, a machine learning system because everything is potentially protected by copyright. So the, the, the stuff you're allowed with relative security in terms of risk to pour into your machine learning system to train it, for example, let's say you need 20 million photographs um, to train a machine learning system. Uh, where are you gonna get 20 million photographs? Uh, every photograph, basically since the dawn of history, is still protected by copyright. Uh, so even if you could source 20 million photographs, how are you going to clear 20 million photographs? How are you going to clear uh, a million re sound recordings if you want to use an algorithm to do something interesting with sound or music? Um, how are you going to clear uh, you know, 5 million video clips? Uh, and as Sam pointed out, there are a few companies out there who have five million video clips and 20 million photographs and a million and a half sound recordings. Uh, and they're either cleared uh, because, for example, if you uploaded it to Facebook or YouTube, you agreed to allow those companies to do things with that stuff as a condition of your having uploaded it, uh, read your terms of service. Uh, or there are companies that are just willing to take the risk because they can afford a 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollar legal fight uh, to establish that it's a fair use, for example. Um, but a lot of smaller companies, number one, don't have the data sets, number two, don't have the legal budgets to have that fight. And so a lot of the shape of machine learning is going to be dictated by copyright law, bizarrely enough. Um, particularly, and you see this already all the time, we're already directing machine learning into copyright-free data set areas. So you have artificially, thanks to copyright law, driven a lot of innovation in this very exciting and promising space to work with data sets like uh, uh, you know, geographic data, facts, things that are not copyrightable. So you're gonna have an excess research investment in things that are not copyrightable and too little investment in things that have data sets that have copyright surrounding them. And even, and, and this is the point of Professor Lewandowski's paper, in the areas where that research is happening anyway, where you're talking about using copyrighted data sets, you're going to distort those outcomes because people are going to have to choose uh, data sets that are accessible, that are pre-cleared or public domain, um, and by choosing that smaller sort of non-representative body of data, you're going to skew the outcomes of the machine learning system. So I guarantee you, for example, if you train a machine learning uh, system right now on speech recognition using nothing but public domain books as your input, it's going to be very good at doing old English a la Chaucer it's going to probably be pretty bad at doing, you know, the way English is spoken today. Uh, so I think it's a very interesting way that copyright law is organizing incentives and uh, shaping the direction of innovation and, as Sam correctly points out, who gets to innovate uh, in this area in ways that I think very few people uh, are thinking deeply about, uh, with, of course, the exception of Professor Lewandowski. <clears throat> Awesome. So uh, at this point, I want to turn it open to all you. If you have questions, comments, things that you'd like to have the panel address, feel free to raise your hand. There are some students with microphones. Um, I can also, oh, there you go. Yeah, so why don't we start here and then go back there. Hi, um, my name is Mana Gumagami. I'm a 3L here. 
Um, so I had a question specifically about the Goldman v. Breitbart decision that was just a few months ago in Southern District, um, which basically seems to shut down the Perfect 10 logic that says, uses a server test as inline linking is not copyright infringement. So my question is, what are your intuitions? You think this would just go Second Circuit, gets shut down, goes back to what Perfect 10 says? Like, do you think, it's because it seems to me at least it would have like a huge chilling effect on how you basically everyone like links to everything from your Tumblr page to your news art, like your news website. Um, so yeah, my thoughts are just, why I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, just to set up, a, which is a good question. So <clears throat> this is a district court ruling here in Southern District of New York, which I'm 100% I'm sure now is going up on appeal to the Second Circuit, <laughs> um, but is about this kind of question of, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, how do you hold someone responsible for embedding essentially, right? And so the question is, do you, do you try to locate the question of liability around the actual quote unquote physical server where the thing is stored? Or is there uh, more of a kind of perception of who's providing the image? So let's say I uh, you know, embed something inside of a tweet. In this case, it was a photograph inside of a tweet. I, I'm usually inside of the tweet linking to the original website somewhere or original server somewhere. So it's basically my tweet has an open box in it and, and the image gets imported from whatever that other place is. So the question in the case is, do you hold, because I did the box, do you hold me responsible essentially directly as opposed to a kind of secondary theory of liability? Or do you hold the box, uh, the people who provide the image responsible? And that matters a lot. So I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on what's gonna happen and how that plays out and, you know, and also just how important it is. Because I think it is, a, it is a, an issue that we thought was resolved for a very long time. Uh, there's also, by the way, there's Eastern, the Eastern District of Texas. Texas, yes. Texas. There's a Texas case that also flipped this back and said, no, no, it's not the server, it's whoever frames the image or Content. Just goes to show you there's going to be work for copyright lawyers out there. Um, yeah, so this is very important uh, and uh, it really does, as I mentioned earlier, copyright law really shapes the internet you enjoy today. The fact that when you see a tweet and when you retweet you can have an image that appears that's not an accident. That's not just because that's what the technology affords. That's also because the legal regime allowed it to occur. That wasn't a given. You could have had a set of legal norms that said every person who retweets a tweet that has a photograph that hasn't been cleared is liable for it, and for that matter, the platform is liable for allowing it. You could have had that rule. Um, and if that were the rule, Twitter would look completely different than it does today. Uh, YouTube would look completely different. Facebook would look completely different. All the platforms you use today would look very different. Um, and as Jason correctly pointed out, I mean, the fight here is, should the test be about what's actually happening under the hood? Who's transmitting the bits that make up that photograph? Or should it be, what does it look like? Should that be the test? Because the what does it look like test, which unfortunately is quite attractive to at least two of these uh, district court judges, says, well, it's your tweet, and the photograph appears in your tweet, so you're the one who's liable, because it looks like it's in your tweet, right? And it's the same thing on the web. Uh, if you embed a YouTube video, the question becomes, well, who's actually serving the bits? YouTube's serving the bits. Um, so if you want to use the what's actually going on test, the so-called server test, that's pretty straightforward. I can tell you where those bits are coming from. If on the other hand you want to use the what does it look like test, then, well, I guess you for posting that web page are liable. Uh, and now you're in a world where you have to worry that that thing you embedded, that thing you found on YouTube, that thing you found on Twitter, that thing you found on the web, now you have to clear it. Now you're like the broadcaster. Now you're liable, unless you and your lawyers and in your insurance policies uh, can stand behind whatever it is that you link to, embedded, et cetera. Um, you can immediately appreciate what a different internet experience that would entail. Uh, and that is what's fundamentally at stake in the Breitbart case. It's unfortunate that Breitbart is the lead defendant in that case. It sort of makes people feel like, oh, well, Breitbart's scumbags, whatever. Um, or maybe, for some people, it makes them think Breitbart heroes, whatever. 
Um, but either way, that's not what really matters here. Most of the other defendants in that case are leading media companies um, who, on their news sites, on their newspaper websites, posted this photograph because it was a newsworthy photograph, and they've all been sued as well. Uh, so it raises this question, do you want the internet to look like television where nobody gets to use a photograph or a video or anything else that's embeddable without first clearing it, um, or do you want a world where you're not in trouble unless you knew it was infringing and you know, acted with that knowledge? Interestingly, in Europe, they're having this exact same battle right now in courts in Europe. Uh, and they've come up with a rule, it's a longer conversation, but the crux of it is, yes, you can be responsible for embedding, but only if you knew that the thing you embedded was infringing. So it works out to be a, everything goes until somebody tells you otherwise, or there are some things maybe the court will say you sh should have been obvious to you that it was infringing from the get-go. Um, and so that's how the European courts have tried to, to wrap their arms around this, which isn't so different. In, under US law, we have a secondary liability theory that kind of works similarly, uh, and it's tied to knowledge. Uh, did you know that this thing was infringing when you embedded it? Um, it's, I think that's a sort of reasonable middle position that courts try to sort it out. They're like, if you knew you were doing bad, then bad. But if you didn't know, then that's fine. Um, but how the courts are struggling to get there, and the thing that's most interesting to me is none of this is in the statute, right? You're, we have this whole story that copyright is statutory, legislatures write the law, courts just apply the law. Um, that is bananas when it comes to copyright because the technology moves far too quickly. I mean, certainly my first impression on listening to the Zuckerberg hearings was, oh my God, these members of Congress do not have the first clue about how the internet works. Um, and so the idea that they would legislate this very important question, which I think from a civics class point of view, you would say, well, this is for the, the elected members to put their heads together to come up with a good policy framework, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's not gonna happen. So you have in both the United States and in Europe, courts trying to basically between the lines sort something out that doesn't break the internet. Um, the Breitbart case is a pretty good example in my mind of courts getting that wrong. Uh, and I hope that that gets fixed. Um, we, in the Ninth Circuit, um, in my end of the country, uh, <laughs> we have the more sensible rule, which is we look at what's actually going on, who's actually sending the bits. Uh, but that is a great fight that I thought, that we all thought, was done in the United States. Uh, it had been done, you know, the leading decision uh, in the Ninth Circuit is uh, from 2007. I think that's right, uh, Amazon, Perfect 10 versus Amazon. Uh, so this is 10 years on, we suddenly have this thing get unbuttoned and start becoming a problem again. And like I said, copyright lawyers have job security. And I think this also um, you know, sort of highlights a battle that's being fought on a lot of different fronts right now um, with you know, direct versus secondary liability. And I don't mean to, to lump these together, and they all have their own doctrinal reasons for why they should go different ways. but. Um, you know, this is being fought on the privacy ground with things like the right to be forgotten. Um, it's happening with CDA 230, um, with SESTA and FOSTA, if you guys have been seeing that in the news. Um, you know, and all these traditional protections for the internet um, you know, have been under attack. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's similar issues that are coming up. Bouncer and velvet rope. <laughs> it's, un it's what underlies all of the debates that uh, we are talking about on the internet today. Bouncer and velvet rope, because once you let everybody in the bar, um, then bad people get in the bar. Uh, and the bouncer, we're having a big fight, I think, on privacy, on copyright, across a whole bunch of other questions about when is a bouncer not enough, uh, and is there some middle position between bouncer and velvet rope? So. Um, I just said, yeah, very quickly, like, like, yeah. like a very specific application of this, right? Mm -hmm. So. There's a team at Shapeways that is, in, is responsible for social media, blogging, things like that. Um, those things are full of YouTube videos because that team knows that if they're gonna use a photograph, they need to clear the photograph, it needs to come through us, it needs to be, they're all these, they know there are all these rules, they're gonna have to talk to me about it. Uh, they know they have a lot more leeway if they're embedding a YouTube video because the theory has been 
that you know this is something that if it is a problem, it will get handled through YouTube and it's okay. And so in, in effect, the reason our social media feed, the reason our blog looks the way it does with many of those videos is because of this idea. If that goes away, all of a sudden that changes. And that's, again, there's this underlying copyright law reason that just manifests itself in the experience of people online for very kind of practical reasons. So um, why don't we take two questions, just given time, and then we'll try and uh, uh, go some fast answers. So we had one right there. Why don't we take these two right there, and then we'll come over there if we have time. So why don't you ask your question and then pass the mic. Sure. Um, thank you all. This has been very enlightening. Um, I was struggling to formulate this briefly, but I guess the best way is through metaphor. So to take your metaphor of the bouncer and the velvet rope, my question, I guess, turns on in the context of innovation and stretching copyright law in different directions, um, does the like vertical, vertical integration to an extent of certain very powerful um, service providers, maybe is a delicate way of putting, uh, big entities, big players in tech right now in various fields, whether it be social media, whatever. Um, to what extent does this capacity that they have to absorb risk, um, to be collecting data, and also to be facilitating the creation of algorithms within the same entity, um, turn the bouncer more into like a kind of bouncer you maybe encounter like in a club in Berlin that actually does work very similar to a velvet rope where it's kind of like they become more and more and more of the gatekeeper um, and they actually to a certain extent maybe limit the entry as Sam was kind of saying in the um, non-profit context the entry of innovation if you're not involved to some extent with that entity and just like a kind of tangent from that, if you do want to become involved with the entity without actually working there through some kind of uh, like an independent contractor type situation maybe, how that also plays into um, your, your ability to assert some kind of ownership over if you've produced an algorithm that then this entity wants to use, something like that. So that's a lot in there, but those kind of issues. Um, Okay. Yeah, why don't you pass it I think my question is a little bit simpler because I'm very new to the field. And um, just listening to uh, your presentation, I'm wondering if the internet is accessed globally and people are sharing images globally, does it really make sense we just focus on US copyrights, intellectual property, or is there a movement to create a sort of a global, you know, superseding organization that regulates, just like, a, you know, WTO and some of the supranational entities. I'm beginning to feel that there is a real greater need for this. Yeah, so I think the question is vertical integration, concentration of power, and then also what is the kind of global picture look like, uh, especially as the internet, you know, politics are becoming more global around copyright. I, mean, I can speak to the, to the uh, concentration issue a little bit, uh, very briefly. Um, is when I started at Public Knowledge, when, when the DMCA was written in 1998, you kind of had one size of tech companies. I mean, there were large and small tech companies, but they were all kind of thought of as one class when you think of it in size. Uh, and when I was working at Public Knowledge, a lot of times when there was a new copyright law coming and we would go to Congress and talk about it, we would say, <laughs> this is gonna hurt all tech companies because they're having problems now. As they grow, it's going to be even uh, an even heavier regulatory burden. And I think one of the things that has happened as these, as some companies have gotten larger, and I know this from my work at Public Knowledge. I know this from my work now when I talk to policymakers in Europe and the United States. Um, a lot of times, policymakers will then think about the problem through the lens of a Facebook-sized company or a Google-sized company, and they'll say, "Okay." People are coming to us with this problem. We have a solution that we think works for these companies and these size companies. And actually, we're hearing from these companies because they have permanent presences in these places. Yeah, like this works for us. This makes sense. Um, and they, they often miss the fact that that structure, in fact, works for those companies, which is great. 
but only works for companies that have an infrastructure they can put in place to support those levels of rules. And so what you're doing then is making it much harder for some third party to come in and say, we want to do something new, we want to do something disruptive, because these rules, these compliance rules are not written for, for us. Um, and they aren't written in a way that, they aren't designed to scale, right? The DMCA, at least in theory, you know, you can, you can operate with as a DMCA uh, service provider at a, a nonprofit with no employees or a company with, you know, billions of dollars of revenue. And the structure, at least on some level, makes sense as you move all the way through up, all the way through the growth curve. When you see these newer conversations, a lot of them just start at a place where, well, yeah, of course, you will throw a bunch of people at this problem. You can build this infrastructure. You can build, uh, you know, $60 million worth of content ID, and, and that'll work. And yeah, I'm sure there are people who can't do that, but they aren't here having this conversation. And I, I'm, I fear that we'll see more and more of that, especially at the legislative level, but also in the judiciary, because those are the people who are bringing the cases. And so it's sort of a, a heavier burden falls on the, the great nonprofits that advocate in this space uh, and smaller companies to be able to say, there's a broader range of experience than you are seeing as a policymaker. Um, and you need to take that into account. But that gets harder and harder as there are bigger and bigger companies that really distort that policy conversation. Yeah, I mean, that's the issue that keeps me up at night. <laughs> um, me you too. Know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 for me, it's taking, you know, all the things that I was, you know, that I thought about at Google and everything that I was used to, you know, to thinking about at Google. Um, and then looking at these policy conversations and you know the outcome of cases like Oracle v. Google, um, and thinking about how that's going to affect not the Googles of the world, but startups and nonprofits and everyone who isn't you know at the forefront of those conversations. Um, and I think you know, it, it, I mean Oracle v. Google. I, I think that's the, the piece of that ruling that scares me the most um, is not what it means for Google, but what that means for someone who wants to enter the space next. And you know, I, it, it, it makes me very sad. It makes me concerned. Um, and those are the sorts of things, you know, with SESTA and FOSTA too. When you look at these things, you know, it's it's all well and good to say that a company should be responsible for this or you know for finding that space between the bouncer and the velvet rope. But it's very difficult for a startup to you know to say, okay, well, I need to hire another person to handle this SESTA stuff and another person to handle these takedown requests for the DMCA and. You know, all these system, different things, yeah. and it only builds, right? So those are the things that, about these decisions and about these acts of, by Congress that really scare me. I mean, Zuckerberg yesterday was just saying, you know, we should be more responsible for, you know, for the content on our platforms. Okay, you know, Velvet like we were rope. saying. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, like we were saying, the answer is, you know, well, Facebook can probably afford whatever that means, but... A startup might not be able to, a nonprofit almost certainly couldn't. So it, it's very scary to me. <laughs> and so, Fred, just in terms of the question about global <clears throat> kind of the global picture, right? So, obviously, one of the things about US centric versions of copyright law here is that, you know, a lot of the tech companies have been based here. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons. But what do you think? What, why has this been a U.S. driven conversation in a lot of ways, and why is it now shifting? I guess is. I mean, I think frankly, too much is made of that argument about U.S. companies being based here, because all all of the large U.S. companies are global in footprint, right? Google makes the majority of its revenue outside the U.S., uh, as does Facebook. Um, so I think. Uh, these companies are very aware of their global footprint. So to answer the question directly, um, no, I don't think there's gonna be any effort to create a global copyright law. Uh, I, I, copyright has always been country territory specific. I don't see that as changing. If you look at the traditional places like WIPO, um, where that would be done, uh, those are not uh, fora that are showing energy and growth fact, quite the opposite. So that being said, I think there is outside of the realm of law in, or maybe I should say ancillary to international law, there's an enormous amount of norm setting that is going on globally, uh, particularly in trade agreements. Uh, and so there has been a big effort in bilateral and multilateral trade agreements to export a certain kind of copyright agenda 
um, in my view, mostly set by big American content, uh, you know, media companies for the most part. Uh, so there is that norm setting is happening. Uh, and then the third thing is I think there is just standardization. Uh, companies that operate at scale, particularly tech companies that, for whom scale is their, their mantra, right? I mean, if you look at a company like Google or Facebook or Twitter or any of these companies, they are serving billions of users with tens of thousands of employees. That has never happened before, right? There is no company, there's been no moment in history where a company so small has served such a large audience. Uh, and that means scale and efficiency are at a premium at every moment. And so that means if there is a notice and takedown regime that is in the United States and Europe, that's what the rest of the world is going to get too. Because these companies are not going to build a bespoke system for just one country. Um, they're just not going to do it. It doesn't make sense. Now, if the person who changes the law happens to be the European Union, which is 28 slash 29 countries uh, altogether, well then yeah, then maybe you can get the company to say, well, you know, for you 29 countries acting together, okay, we wouldn't want to have to exit your market. So there is just the reality, which is uh, large markets, large groups of countries uh, have more indirect leverage to get uh, global companies to adjust their uh, practices. Um, and so I think there is, if you look, notice and takedown is, while it originated in the United States and then was quickly adopted by Europe in 2001, that has become the de facto norm for copyright, uh, basically globally. Uh, and it would be hard to change that. Countries that wanted to radically depart from that rule uh, would have to consider very carefully uh, whether they have that leverage and, and how uh, it large platforms that their citizens depend on every day might respond. Um, on the vertical integration question, the thing that I feel good about is internet companies are terrible media companies, right? Or I should be clear, platform companies are terrible <coughs> media companies. Netflix, great media company, right? But not a platform company, right? You don't get to upload what you want to Netflix. That's not how that works. Um, so I'm not so worried about companies like Facebook or Google or others um, suddenly deciding to exercise their authority in an anti-competitive way to favor their own in-house movies. And, you know, come on. We're, we're just not good at that. I mean, I love YouTube, but the number of uh, efforts YouTube has been making to make successful franchises, you know, the popularity of those franchises is dwarfed by the popularity of everything else on the platform. And I think that's never gonna change. Um, so I'm not worried about that. But I am very worried about what Sam was mentioning. The, the shift from the bouncer to the velvet rope is not coming because they want to favor their own internal properties. It's coming because there's an enormous social pressure going on right now to, uh, you know, deal with the bad guys who are in the bar. Uh, and what worries me is the side effect, the unintended consequence of that rush will be to suddenly create a velvet rope where a lot of good people can't get in the bar. Uh, and that to me is the dangerous trade-off. I, I really, I deeply believe that most of the people in the bar are great people. And if we're going to kick 40% of the people out of the bar just to get after the 1% that are bad, that really scares me. Uh, and I, I feel like that's the way the wind is blowing right now. So that, that, the vertical integration piece worries me that way because whatever the rules are on Facebook and YouTube, um, that's gonna be the rules we all will have to live with. Uh, and I worry that, you know, the good go with the bad in terms of getting thrown out. Well, and on that uplifting note. <laughs> no, um, so we are up against time. I want to say that we can probably hang around for a few minutes after we're all done. But please join me in thanking the panel here. And thank you all for being a part of it. <laughs>